Well, Maria couldn't make it today. She had business to attend to. So no Maria Lawrence on the program today. Bill, I have to say, is doing an admirable job. Good job, Admiral. You're you're a master player in the words, Rob. Our guest in this segment is none other than the Senate President and Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Craig Blair. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Th- thank you for having me on. I might note this is two consecutive appearances where the open that plays ahead of you did not antagonize the lion. The I'll Tigers team. <laughs> the Tigers team. <laughs> but, 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 but we I'm had, a little disappointed. Yeah, but, 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 Craig, we have the sticks ready to poke in the bear. <laughs> uh, that's all right. I'm used to it. So. Uh, did you enjoy that little segment there from Governor Jim talking about Joe Manchin and the uh, the, the neighborhood bully thing? Uh, did, did, you know what? It sounded like Vince Deeds. That's I didn't hear the very beginning. I called in at nine oh four, of and so I didn't get to hear the whole part of it. Uh, but Vince Deeds is a senator from down in Greenbrier, and I thought well, this is odd. That, that's who it sounded like. That was the governor speaking. That was Jim when when Joe Manchin released the statement, "I will win whatever race I enter." And I asked Governor Justice about that as a candidate who could potentially take on Joe Manchin in a general election if it got to that point. Uh, That was his response, that that sounds a lot like the bully standing on the corner saying, I'll take on anybody, fight him and beat him, and uh, then you end up getting your butt whooped, (laughs) was what Big Jim was saying. So. Yeah, um, it, it, you know what? This is all. This is going on way too early for me. It is. It is very <laughs> to early. To be honest with you, uh, but I guess that's the way it goes when you got a competitive environment, and that's a good thing. We got about a what a, a year and a week until the uh, West Virginia primaries, I think. Uh, let's talk about this uh, revenue beat for April, Craig, of over $300 million. That takes the state's year-to-date surplus up to $1.585 billion. That is the biggest month of the year surplus-wise for the state of West Virginia. Yeah, personal income tax uh, drove the vast majority of that. The personal income tax was $192 million above the revenue estimates. Th- this is a wonderful thing, and it's $439 million uh, for the year above revenue estimates. People are working in West Virginia. People are making more money in West Virginia. Uh, our workforce participation rate is growing. All oh, absolutely wonderful things that puts us in a, uh, a posture to be able to do the tax reductions that we did this year. Uh, now, in the following months, uh, people are going to be seeing uh, a reduction uh, or more money on their paycheck because there's going to be less West Virginia personal income tax removed from their check. So they'll see an increase on that, and the state will then start seeing less of personal income tax revenues coming in. And that is, of course, unless we've got more people going to work and more jobs, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow the tax base, uh, broaden it, so to speak, uh, and making it so that you can be taxed less. If you've got more per- people participating, uh, more people that are contributing to the tax base, then you can lower taxes across the board for everyone. And that's been the overall plan on what we've been working on. Uh, severance tax collections were $17.5 million above the revenue estimates. In fact, the revenue estimate was $18 million, and it was 17.5. Uh, above that. So we almost matched what the estimate was. Uh, and there, ex- for the year, of uh, the severance tax uh, revenue estimate or have been exceeding, for year to date, $622 million. So you add those two together, that's a billion dollars all in its own. Uh, personal, in- or excuse me, consumer sales tax uh, was 16.7 million above the revenue estimates uh, so and actually tobacco was a little bit uh, above estimates normally they're below uh, but it was only like 364,000 uh, above the revenue estimates so all these things are absolutely good news for the state of West Virginia that puts us for our year to date and you've already stole my thunder on that was 1.5 uh, excuse me 
Yeah, you're right. Billion five hundred eighty-five million dollars uh, over estimates. Uh, now let's get, get ourselves back to reality, though, and that is is that we uh, in the surplus section of the budget, we actually used I believe it was about eight hundred million dollars of that uh, already. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, for one-time expenditures, of inst- they're not base building, but for instance, uh, consolidated labs, uh, where if we can get our labs right in this state and not spread all over the place, uh, we can actually have a greater return. Uh, for instance, uh, somebody needed to, uh, somebody gets murdered, you need to do labs of uh, on that. If we can get a turnaround time done with the uh, the results on those lab, the lab work on that, then what happens is people spend less time in prison, uh, less time waiting for court dates. That's just one example. If you can actually speed up all that process and get away from the backlogs, and so you're investing in your future to where you can actually save money on the backside of it by spending a little bit on the front side. These are the. This is you're hearing the mindset on how we're trying to run our government in an efficient manner uh, that makes it so that we can put more resources. And, and lower taxes both at the same time. The rainy day fund balance is under a billion dollars, Craig. It's less than it was last year. Is that a matter of uh, investment return performance? Yes, of uh, 100% that. And, uh, and t- t- we had investments that were in Eastern Europe. Uh, and then the, the overall has been down. Now, it's been climbing back up. Uh, the previous month, it, it was down, it looks like, about $20 uh, million. So it's climbing back up. But I figured that by the time that we get to July the 1st, that we're going to end up needing to move about $200 million into the rainy day fund. Uh, and, and that's okay. That's almost a buy low, sell high strategy. Uh, from that standpoint, um, we put a cap on the rainy day fund, but it, it is a percentage of what our general revenues are. And you have to so. keep a certain percentage of the general revenues in the rainy day fund to ensure the highest bond rating you can get, correct? Uh, well, it's, it, we don't have the highest bond rating, but it's, uh, I forget what it is now. I think it's A plus uh, on that, and there's still a better bond rating. But we've got an excellent bond rating. Uh, it's just not perfect yet. Notice how I said yet there? I did. Uh, because <laughs> the, the better your bond rating, the lower the interest rates are on your bonds and uh, makes it so that we are able to do things better. Billy? Yeah. So, uh, go, hey, hey, go ahead. Hey, hey, let's talk about the pensions, too. Our pensions are in great shape as well in this state. So, you know, to, 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 I, I won't, Bill, you wanted to ask a question, so I'll no, stop. Go, no, go, go, go right ahead, Craig. I, my question will wait till you finish. Yeah, because they weren't in great shape not that, all that long exactly ago. Exactly right. Yeah, that's a real uh, yeah, major comment. The, the public comment, employees' yeah. of pension uh, right now is 98.8% funded. Teachers of defined benefit one is 78.4%. And anything that's 80% or funded, uh, 80% or better, I consider fully funded, okay, because that means everybody's trying to draw on at the same time. State police plan A, 95.1%. State police uh, plan B, 86.4%. The judges, uh, 239% funded. Uh, Emergency medical services, 102. Municipal police and firefighters, 140% funded. I left off a couple of them because they're minor uh, when it comes to that. But what it is is that if you're trying to attract businesses into the state or businesses that are currently here and get them to grow, it, if we're, our pensions were in terrible shape, why would you want to come here? Because you're going to be uh, t- the natural assumption is we're going to get taxed more to be able to pay our pension obligations. Nope. That's another economic development tool that we have in our back pocket. And we're working on a plan to be able to get everything 100% funded and save $400 million out of our general revenue budget each year. 
Well, well done, because only about, uh, what, 10 years or so ago, our, these pensions were practically bankrupt. So you've done a great job turning that around. Let me give it a little yeah. bit of credit here. And this, I've took, they started the turnaround back in 1992 when I believe that the teacher's retirement fund was 6% funded. Okay, and but it, uh, that was of uh, the the Democrat Party that set up uh, a course in place. They knew that they had to get this, and it actually extracted a lot of money out of the general revenue where they couldn't do things. And then when the Republicans took over, we stayed the course, and actually we've been trying to do the best we can to accelerate it. But the people need to take credit too, and that is is that in that time period they also made it so that there was a constitutional amendment that allowed uh, us to be able to invest some of the resources, some of these pensions, into the stock market. And you were able to see those return on investment. Before, we weren't able to do that, and they were only able to do bonds. So you had a very, very poor return on that. So we're, we've been behaving more fiscally prudent. Of, and so to notice how I give a lot of praise to a lot of people. Uh, for, for us to get to where we're at today. But it, it takes a big monkey off your back, that's for sure. Craig, this may have been discussed uh, previous. I have not heard it, but it was. How was your trip to Taiwan? The trip to Taiwan was excellent. Uh, I can tell a couple stories on that. First of all, I was there in 2018. And uh, Taiwan and their people are t- similar, if not t- one of the t- – Closest examples of being great people that I've ever seen in my life. And I love the people in West Virginia. Uh, you're welcome with warm hospitality uh, from that standpoint. Now, uh, the, the terrain is very, very similar to West Virginia. They got some flat area, but they got a lot of mountainous areas. Uh, but then they also have a lot of industry. And they have some investment in the state of West Virginia right now. And uh, they wanted to do um, – and talk to me about it back in 2018 on um, an upper trade office. And I believe there's 15 other trade offices uh, in Taiwan right now. So we were either the 16th or 17th of tomping up over there. And it's for $250,000 you got a uh, trade office. And this trade office, uh, well, while I was there and we were doing the grand openings, I had four companies come and talk to me specifically about wanting to come and invest in West Virginia. So that's going to give us opportunities. Far East, Far East New Century is already invested in West Virginia in Mason County. I forget the actual name of the company that is in West Virginia. Of uh, I, I can't keep track of names, as most people know. Uh, but it, it's going to be a huge advantage for West Virginia and the friendship of uh, the bond that is there. When I was when we were doing it. I had three WVU graduates that were of Taiwanese descent come up to me and tell me about their experience in West Virginia. And, of course, they're in business now in Taiwan. So we, there is this, even though it's on the other side of the world, there is a real potential to be able to, to, to do some growth. And I went to Foxconn, too. Of, and that's where the, the company that manufactures the iPhones, and they're a Taiwanese-based company that have of manufacturing plants all over the world. Of, and I'd love to be able to see us land something like that in West Virginia. Thinking big, but you can go small too. So, uh, so you you developed upon the relationship you had three or four years or so ago, and so you suspect there's going to be some emerging opportunities from this particular visit. I can almost guarantee it's going to happen because whenever I told them that I'd go along with them in the trade office, I said we're going to actually improve our relationships, trade both directions, and and if that works, we'll continue to do it. If it does not work, we'll turn the switch off. And so and that's a point-blank statement from Craig Blair. I'm not going to invest our taxpayer dollars in something that is just a name only. It has to have a return on the investment. And I believe that it will. Uh, 
But, you know, you, you got to be able to reach out and be able to compete. And the governor of Virginia was there just a week before us talking about doing a trade office. And uh, Senator Bryce Freeze was with me. Uh, and uh, when we were up in our trade office, I was sending pictures. Uh, Bryce is a senator in Virginia. And he was telling me, our governor was just there last week. And I said, yeah, but our trade office got up before yours. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm very proud of it. Let me shift subject again, if I can. Uh, you're having a special session starting this weekend. Uh, what is it going to address? Okay, it's not a special session. It's uh, remote interims, and it'll be in Huntington. And it'll be okay. the normal things that we do okay. during interims, uh, preparing legislation, solving problems of the, that we deal with uh, on the I, I deal with on the daily basis, uh, for that matter, and getting prepared for it, uh, that, that next upcoming session. Uh, but then, to, to, but it's not a special session. Uh, special sessions to actually do legislation. You vote on legislation. This isn't like that. These are your committee meetings. And uh, we, last year we started them back up where we did one up in Capen, and it's good for people from, say, McDowell County to get to the Eastern Panhandle. It's good for people from the Eastern Panhandle to get to the Cabell County area and to be able to see what is going on in those communities and to have a, it creates a teamwork effect of on being able to understand each other because we've got five or six very, very diverse regions in the state of West Virginia. So you need to be able to understand others' problems. That way you can actually get the votes to be able to get things done. Yeah, I can appreciate the, the networking, uh, but so no legislation will be passed through this remote, uh, but there will be building blocks put in place for subsequent uh, legislation. Well, the... Uh I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That'll be placed, and you know, it, it's the gauntlet of things. There'll be pension meetings. There'll be of uh, of uh, education meetings. There'll be finance meetings, uh, energy and uh, meetings. All those committees will be working uh, the topics of on how to improve West Virginia. How many of our local folks will be at, will be attending? Ah. Uh, do, do not do head counts on that. But, uh, on, as far on, as I know, every senator okay. will be there uh, for, from the Eastern Panhandle. So it's going to be uh, for senators and not for the delegates. What's oh the no, delegates no, the delegates will be there well. too. Okay. Yeah. I just don't. Uh, I don't have any idea. Oh, there's no roll call taken until the meetings start on that. And you know, sometimes people got vacations or work to do, so there. Well, there will not be 100% participation, but that is the way interim meetings go normally to begin with. Senate President Craig Blair, our, our guest here on the program. Craig, what's the progress report on uh, um, uh, high-speed Internet in West Virginia in regards to reaching all corners of the state eventually? Uh, it's moving right along. It's not moving as fast as what we'd like, but keep in mind that the contractors and the people that do this uh, are busy all over the country doing the same thing. Uh, it, it's moving forward. Uh, the last of uh, interims, when we got got a report, excuse me, when we didn't get a report, but normally we get a broadband report for the Joint Committee of Government and Finance, Mitch Carmichael, who gives that report, of we didn't get one because he was out of the country at that point in time. Well, let's put it this way. I don't know why he was out of country, but he wasn't available to be able to do the report. And uh, there was a request made to, to, uh, by, I believe, Delegate Summers that uh, for the next one that we wanted to actually get how many more miles and households have received Internet. So the next meeting that we have for the government and finance, which will be in Huntington, we should be able to get that report. And I'll, be, I'll, I'll get ready and text you over the hard numbers on that. That would be great yeah. to know. Is, is some of that improvement here in the eastern panhandle as well, Craig? Oh, yeah. I already know that there's been improvements made in the eastern panhandle, yes. 
Yeah. And, and I'm certain that we've got listeners right now say, that's not me. Uh, <laughs> I guarantee you. Yeah, no. yeah I, 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 I get it. And we're, go, we're doing the best that we, uh, we can with that uh, without the government itself uh, going out here and creating its own Internet company, uh, so to speak. You, and I, I believe that you know, what you want is a competitive environment. You want uh, – Frontier, and you want uh, Xfinity of uh, Comcast, uh, all as many of them as you can get, competing against each other and pushing out the fiber of as much as you can out here to be able to get that high speed internet in place. Uh, what we've done uh, to, to well over a billion dollars of investment of on to you know to saying to. to target this money or to target these areas. And that's where Mitch is really good at being able to talk about that because he's got these overlays that show where the, where the uh, it's being put out. But if you live, you know, if you live one mile back on a road and you're all by yourself and everything, you're going to be one of the last people that's going to see that internet connection uh, because you got to be able to make it, uh, those are the the last miles. Those are difficult to get done uh, because it, it may cost uh, a half million dollars to get that line to you, and it would be 500 years before they ever recoup. Craig, you may have answered the return on investment. Yeah. You may have answered my question. We were talking about competition, uh, but this effort has been going on for the last seven, eight, nine years, maybe more. And you have been critical, and I think very deservingly so, of some of the prior efforts. Have we taken steps to correct some of the problems that we've had with these previous records, uh, previous efforts? Yes, yes. And it's because I am critical about it. Everybody knows that Mitch Carmichael and I are good friends. Uh, and I am on him hot and heavy uh, about some of this stuff because I don't like lip service. I don't like people coming in and telling you uh, what you want to hear and not the, the accuracy uh, that you need to have. And he knows this. And, and so... We keep our thumb on top of them, uh, on, on what's going on. And so Mitch is doing more than just uh, broadband, uh, but it has not slipped by us in any way because we understand that the greater the broadband that you can have deployed in the state, the property values go up. The likelihood of people being able to want to move there and live there uh, improve. It is as, almost as essential as what electricity is now in water and sewer never would have thought that bill when you and i yeah. were boys yeah. of out there of growing up that, that anything like this would be so imperative uh but the, how you communicate it is the telephone system yeah. of the 19 19- Hundreds. Yeah, my question is not so much the importance. We all recognize the importance. My question is, are there uh, procedures in place that will avoid or prevent some of these very large missteps we had uh, the last push, seven, eight, nine years or so ago? In getting the, well, the those missteps down. was misappropriation of the dollars of when they should have been getting to, uh, things done. And that, that is not happening now to any of my awareness. Of, and like I said, we do keep our thumb on that. Mitch knows the industry very well. He's worked in it for both Frontier uh, and uh, CityNet uh, at one point in time. So there's not a better person out there to have an understanding of that. Now, he's a capitalist also. Of and uh, capitalist understands that the government doesn't really solve problems. Most of the time, they create them. Uh, but what you do is, is you get these companies to compete against each other and to be able to deploy this out. And you can see that taking place uh, with uh, both Frontier. Uh, Frontier's been hanging fiber all over the place in the Eastern Panhandle, and I, and I've been highly critical of Frontier. But you've noticed I've gotten quieter uh, because they are are investing in the state of West Virginia from that standpoint, but uh, I'm still on the trust but verify mode. Craig, final question before you go, and uh, in regards to the Taiwanese trip, it was my understanding that that was not financed by West Virginia tax dollars. Do I have that correct or not? 
Uh, the the trip of uh, d- for me and the delegates and the senators that went over there was not paid for by the West Virginia tax dollars. Uh, the 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 actual deployment of the trade office uh, was put into the budget of uh, it was either one hundred and fifty or two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I've drawn a blank on that. That that's all it cost on the trade office up over there. Who, who paid uh, for the trip to Taiwan? The Taiwanese did. Uh, they do that uh, with a lot of states. Uh, they have uh, uh, in their budget an allocation that's put forward to be able to build these friendships. Uh, and so they pay for 100% of that. I do believe that I've got myself a, a parking bill that i got to pay for for Dulles Airport for about $150 for parking down there uh, for that time period. But other than that, uh, it, it's paid for them by them top to bottom. Just put that on the stubble field tab, uh, Craig, if you well, don't mind. I, I, I got to ask a question. Did, is there something going on saying that uh, we're over there on the taxpayer's dollar? There was a question in the Facebook community as to the trip, yes. Oh, uh, uh, that's Facebook. I guess is it, they get the information wrong or echo chamber. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is no. Uh, not one penny of West Virginia tax dollars is spent on that. Good to talk with you, sir. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, welcome. At, uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Take care. Thanks, Thank you. Craig.